and thank you for attending the Storytelling Cafe. We are so thrilled to share with you some of the fairy tales and wondrous tales written by a selection of students from this spring's German 365 course on German fairy tales, taught by Professor Ostmeyer. As students from the class, we were challenged to create our own fairy tales, written either in the style of the Tales of the Brothers Grimm or modernized and reworked into a contemporary style inspired by the art of Kansas artist Peregrine Honig. To prepare for such a task, we began by asking, what makes a fairy tale a fairy tale? Within this distinct genre, each tale contains its own abstract kind of logic, narrative structure, and purpose. The Grimm's tales play out in contrasts, and definite actions separate the good from the evil and the wondrous from the mundane. In these tales, anything can transform, whether it be young children into birds or the desperately poor into the fabulously wealthy. Heroes are always left with their needs fulfilled, the villains punished, and the moral compass set right by the end. These classic tales were collected by the Brothers Grimm in the early 19th century. In the Grimm's own preface to their first edition of their collection, they write that, telling these tales is so extraordinary a custom that one must like it, no matter what others say. Indeed, there is a sense of abstract universality to these tales, which has allowed them to remain meaningful for so long, and inspired us to transform our classroom into a storytelling gathering today. These tales and their cross-cultural roots have long served as inspiration for diverse writers, filmmakers, and artists to explore the fantastical and miraculous and to incorporate subversive social commentary. As an example, in the Grimm's tale, Mother Hole, the marvelous world liberates the enslaved stepdaughter and punishes the greedy mother and her daughter. Social hierarchies are reversed at the end of this classical tale, and the dutiful daughter emerges happily rewarded. Such tropes are not always present, however, in modern and postmodern tales. In these tales, ethical beliefs can be compromised. There are no strict gender rules, and inner turmoil is exposed to the world. These characters have complex psyches. A princess could become a knight, true love may not be a reality, and any traditional motifs may be revolutionized. In the style of the classical tales, individual internal conflicts of the characters are totally removed only to be added again in the contemporary reworkings. The art of Peregrine Honig's Father Gander series is one example of the reworking of such classical motifs into relevant and insightful social commentary. During our class, we engaged in discussions with the Jordan Schnitzer Museum of Art regarding Peregrine Honig's interpretations of tales such as Snow White, Cinderella, and Red Riding Hood. We discussed how she takes on the coming-of-age themes of the original tales and reincorporates them into an adult setting with modern commentary. Today, we will only present five of the 59 fantastic tales written by students of the class. So please, sit back, relax, sip your drinks, and prepare to experience the marvelous. Hi there, my name is Basil Hadamio Nicholson, and I am a freshman here at the University of Oregon, currently studying art, and today I'm going to be presenting my story, The Boy in the Fawn. I particularly had a really fun time mimicking the style of the Grimm's while also creating an original narrative. I hope you have a wonderful time listening to it. The Boy in the Fawn. There once was a king to whom his wife bore two sons. As the two boys grew, it became apparent that although they were nearly identical in age, they could not be more varying in disposition. The younger brother held steadfast in his will and cunning, while the older was found to be more naive and docile in demeanor and heart. Due to his guileless nature, the king grew increasingly wary of the eldest's ability to properly govern once the time came. The king eventually reached a point where he found himself utterly dissatisfied by his son's existence, 
and in a fit of unease, he said, Never have I met a boy so unfit to rule as my dear son. I wish he would burden me no longer, so that his younger brother may take place as my successor without ill will or consequence. The next morning, when the oldest son awoke, he found that he was no longer in the same body where he had spent his previous years of living. Rather, he was now in that of a fawn. When the king learned of his son's transformation, he did not find himself saddened, and promptly instructed his huntsman to lead the young deer out into the forest with a simple set of instructions. Do not kill it, for I feel no malice towards this creature. Instead, you must lead him off into the depths of the wood, and take care to leave no trace, so that he may have no hope of return. And with that, the eldest son's presence in the kingdom was no more. Many months after the fawn was sent to the woods, a young man happened upon his path while collecting herbs for his ailing mother. The young man went up to the fawn and sat next to it, for he found that the fawn did not run from him like many others he had encountered. They sat in quiet for many moments, simply enjoying each other's company. If someone were to have come across them, they surely would have felt as though it was perhaps the first time either of the two boys had felt such kindness from a stranger in a long while. In due time, the boy and the fawn began discussing amongst themselves. Nothing of importance or depth, but the two strangers quickly grew fond of each other. When he sensed that their time together was coming to a draw, the deer nuzzled quietly against the hand of the human next to him and spoke. I am thankful for your kindness, and I would not want to be known to you as a burden. But if I can ask of you one request, to return me to my natural state, for until now I have known nothing but unhappiness and misfortune in this body. The boy felt a wetness on his palm as the fawn began to weep, and he replied, Do not cry, small one. Now find a way to relieve you of your curse. However, I ask of you one thing in return. The fawn shook his head in a show of understanding. My mother is sick, and although it should be a nothing of worry, I would like to ask of you to watch over her. That way I may leave in good conscience knowing that she will be cared for and you will be safe as well. The deer hastily agreed, and the deal was struck. So the boy set off on a long journey through the woods, but by the time it began to turn to night, he had found himself hopelessly lost. With no one near to keep him company, he turned his head towards the sky and spoke to its rising inhabitant. O oh, dear moon, help me for I am lost, and have nothing but your presence to guide me. And as if by some miracle, the moon descended with a square of silk in hand. Hear my sweet child take this gift, for I have no need for it, and it may be of help to you as you go along. The young man nodded, took the handkerchief in hand, and turned to find that the moon's presence had illuminated the trail which he had once thought to be gone. The young man felt no need for rest, and thus continued his journey throughout the night, and with each step he grew deeper and deeper into the woods. But by the time the sky began to grow light, he had found himself faced with the tangle of thorn bushes which covered the trail. With no one in sight to call, he turned his head towards the sky and spoke to its rising inhabitant, O oh, kind sun, help me, for I am stuck, and have nothing but your presence to serve me. And as if by some miracle, the sun descended, holding on a cluster of bat bones white as milk. Here, my tender child, take this gift. I know it is not much, but I'm sure you can find some use for it. The young man thanked the sun as he wrapped the little bones into his silk handkerchief. And when he looked up, he found that its presence had burnt back the briar which had once obstructed his path. The trail which the boy followed wound past countless streams and twisting trees, but showed no signs of nearing a destination. And thus yet another day of tireless travel had left the young man worn and without a clue of where his journey would end. With little hope left, he turned his heavy head towards the sky and whispered to its inhabitants, O oh, gentle stars, help me, for I have no clue where this journey leads me, and I have nothing but your wisdom to rely on. And as if by some miracle, the stars fell down upon the ground around him, carrying with them a long red ribbon. Here, my gracious child, take this gift, and combine it with the other treasures in your possession, because a sure luck will be on your side. The young man wound the ribbon around the parcel of silk and bone in his pocket, and affixed it to the wrist of his right hand, and when he looked up, he found that the stars scattered around him had turned to stepping stones. The boy followed the glowing path ahead of him until he found himself at the doorstep of a cottage. He reached out to knock on the door, but when the back of his hand struck the wood, it swung gently open. Before him, he found himself facing the back of an aged man, who turned to him and said, What is it you come here for? I'm searching for a way to aid my dear friend. He was struck with a curse a good while ago, and it has begun to be unbearable, he replied. The older man hummed in understanding, then stood silent for a moment, as if to think on something. I can help you, but of course there is a price to everything, for very little kindness can be met without an exchange, he spoke. As you wish, sir, but I do not have much of value that I can give you. The boy was well aware of how empty his pockets had become throughout his journey. Anything on his person which he would be willing to part with was the necessary provision for his return. This, however, did not prove to be the immense problem he foresaw it to be once the man before him stirred him from his thoughts. 
Quit worrying so, the man spoke. I do not wish for any possessions or monetary exchange. In return for my help, all I would wish for is to play a simple hand of cards. It has been long since anyone has bested me in a gamble, and so your victory would prove to be payment enough. The boy remembered the words of the stars and agreed with one condition. If we are to play with your deck, I insist that I am allowed to deal. I swear that I will not apply any trickery of my own accord. The old man saw this to be a fair request, and so they sat down at the table before them. The young man shuffled the cards, and without putting much thought into the manner, dealt the cards with his dominant right hand. This would not be anywhere near noteworthy if it had not been for the fact that this was the hand whose wrist was fastened with red ribbon. From the deal, the game was set, and it was a game of luck rather than strategy which the old man had chosen, and within a few moments the young man had won. The older man congratulated him on his victory, and assured him that by the time he had returned home that his friend's condition would be rectified. With that small reassurance, the boy went backwards through the forest, the trek made easier by the lingering evidence of his previous campaign. He arrived shortly at the house he shared with his mother, and upon entering he saw her at their small wooden table, accompanied by a boy whose age could not have been too far off of his own. The fawn had been returned. Overcome by the success of his journey, the young man swept his friend into an embrace, soon joined as well by his mother, who was thankful for the return of both her son and her health. From then on, the three lived happily and in peace for the rest of their days. Hello, my name is Liberty Russell, and I am a fine arts major. Today, we'll be reading my tale, Son of the Sun, which draws inspiration in what is a classic fairy tale. Alrighty, let's get to it. We know of a world of light and dark, day and night. In times of the not so distant past, there was another time, the time of twilight, of the half awake and the half alive. This time was one of deception, where creatures lived like humans during the day and vampires at night. Whether one was friend or foe was never known, except for the case of a humble hero. Born out of a drop of sunshine that landed in a well, the child was born impervious to the spell of the moon. He was found as the last trace of dawn danced across the sky by a spinster who heard his cries from the well. Drawing him up with a bucket, she saw how even covered in muck, the handsome boy glowed warmly, like a flame. The spinster brought him into her home, for she had no children, and here they would come to live and love each other as mother and son. In this time of twilight, there also lived a sorcerer in a large castle on a mountain, on an island, in a lake, who hated humanity. The sorcerer had one enchantment more powerful than any other. One night, when the moon shined brightest, the sorcerer sang a song so beautiful, the moon fell in love with the sorcerer's voice. So bewitched and entranced was the moon by the song, the moon would linger longer and longer into the night as time went on and come earlier and earlier during the day to hear him sing. One night, the sorcerer put his plan into motion and sung to the moon. Moon so beautiful and bright, I wish only to live in your light. Men grow so nasty and bold, in reality their hearts are so cold. Creatures of the night are what they are, their blood frenzy does nothing but mar, and at the theft of daylight blood they will seek, doomed to eternity to be unknowingly weak. So please, dear moon, won't you please stay? For you truly are more beautiful than the brightest of days. Enchanted by the sorcerer's song, the moon remained outside the sorcerer's balcony. The sun could no longer light the earth, and instead the moon remained high in the sky, leaving the world in darkness and night. And so it was. The sorcerer bewitched the moon, and a world of night was born. Starved of daylight, the world began to change. Gone were the trees and the bees, the flowers and the birds, the smell of freshly tilled earth and home cooking. People began to change, hunger overtaking. They began to turn on each other, devouring flesh and blood. And so creatures of the night were born out of necessity and hunger. But there was one that remained unturned the boy born from a drop of sun. Burning bright from within, 
He stood alone in a world of darkness and unceasing hunger. Seeing the horrors on earth, the sun came to the boy and spoke to him so. Gone is the light and remains only the darkest night. Seek the egg of death, end it, and with it the sorcerer's last breath. Go on, child of mine, and bring back the light sublime. Then all the earth can delight and end this endless night. Before being chased off by the moon, the sun warmed the palms of the boy's hands with the soul fire that the boy himself was born from and that keeps the core of the earth warm. Holding the breath of life, the boy set off to seek the egg of death. Journeying endless days and nights, the boy warded off the creatures of the night with his fierce internal light, as he shone too fiercely for the bloodsucker's nocturnal eyes. One day, the boy in his exhaustion tripped over a toadstool, crumbling to the ground. Ouch! Watch where you're going, grumbled a small voice about shin height. Apologies, sir. I meant no harm, said the boy as he rubbed his shin. In the dim light, he saw the gnome's eyes light up with recognition. And the boy asked, I seek the egg of death to end it and with the sorcerer's last breath. To which the gnome replied, You're the son of the sun. Your glowing beauty marks you so. Earthly creatures know of earthly things, and so it be we know the item we seek. The egg of death you search for is cold and lifeless, and we gnomes dare not go there. It lies inside of the Sorcerer's Mountain, on an island, in a lake, inside a cave's colony of bats, and inside of a bat lies the egg. Find what you seek, else humanity be doomed to be forever weak, and to the torments of night, and drain each other of blood, food, vigor, and delight. And away sunk the gnome into the earth, as quick as it came. Bewildered, but elated with hope, the son of the sun began his quest for the egg of death that lay inside of a mountain, on an island, in a lake, inside of a cave's colony of bats, and inside of a bat. The sun arrived at the edge of this lake and looked across the water to the castle atop the mountain, in the center of the lake, where the moon appeared to be sitting across and atop of the tallest turret of the castle. After crossing the lake, the son of the sun walked the perimeter of the island, and he found a small cave opening, higher than most would ever think or wish to climb. Scaling the mountainside, the son of the sun entered the cave and found the colony of bats. As he approached, the creatures began to gravitate towards his glowing warmth, swarming him. For even though bats are beasts of the night, they too crave warmth. Walking deeper and deeper towards the heart of the mountain, more and more bats swirled around him, creating a storm of leathery wings that gently clipped his body, colder than ice his breath crystallized, but he remained warm in the comforting heat of the soul fire. Through the cyclone of wings and furry bodies, the sun of the sun reached out with his warm hands for the cold slickness of evil. He grasped and captured the largest bat, where within lay an egg, the egg of death. His grasp turned crushing, so only dust remained. The cyclone of bats fled from the castle into the fresh air, swarming the sorcerer's castle and bit him to death. And then there was silence. Deafening silence. In the absence of all sound, the boy began to notice the one's indistinguishable melody that surrounded the mountain on an island in a lake was truly and utterly gone. At the opening of the cave, he watched the moon begin to sink in the sky in the rising rosy blush of dawn light upon the horizon, taking over the castle on the mountain, on the island, in a lake, the son of the sun resided as a new ruler when the world began anew and the horror of the night torments began a distant memory. My name is Robert Bishop, and my story is called Old Scratch Eyes. My tale is inspired by the lost folk tale of raw head and bloody bones, also known as Old Wall Eyes, Scratch Eyes, or English Raw Head. This tale originated in Britain sometime during the 1500s, 
and mention of it appear in various texts, but only ever in passing, like the way someone might say, the Sandman is coming. While the original story seems to have disappeared, the creature from the story made its way into the American South and has lived on in variations in the Ozark and Appalachia regions. I mixed in words my grandmother used to say as well as old Arkansas slang. I wanted this to feel like an ancient Southern tale, so I've used place names that create a backwoods atmosphere. I wanted to combine the feeling of a campfire story with the structure of a fairy tale and have attempted to modernize the grim story structure. Once upon a time, deep in the hollers of the Ozarks lived a family of four, a father, a daughter, and two sons. The father had been blessed, being the seventh son of a seventh son. He lived outside of the village of Hope and worked as a yarb doctor and healer. He was known to have magical powers that could cure ailments, predict the future, and control animals. However, there was one creature he could not control because it was neither man nor beast. It did not have a name, but people came to call it Old Scratch Eyes. Legend said that this creature was friends with pestilence and death and that whenever you saw him, the other two would soon follow. The father knew that Old Scratch Eyes wandered the timber woods and swamps and he told his children to avoid them at all costs. Stick to the roads and never look behind you, he would say. As the children grew up, they obeyed their father and always took the roads to town and never once looked behind them. One day, the eldest son went deep into the timber woods to track a sawback hog so that he could prove his skill as a hunter in hopes of courting a local girl in town. He had come upon a large hog when he stepped on a branch which sent the pig running deeper into the woods. Empty-handed and hungry, he took a shortcut through the woods so that he might get home faster. He came upon a black apple tree with long, wangy-doodle vines hanging from its branches. He climbed up into the vines and onto the branches to pick some fruit and rest. While he sat and ate, he heard a voice. My child, why have you come here? The eldest looked around but could not locate the source of the voice, so he answered, to hunt. But my prize got away, so I've decided to pluck this apple and rest. I see, said the voice. Will you pluck one of these apples for me? If you show yourself, I would gladly share an apple, said the eldest. Well, my child, then look behind you. The next day, the second eldest son went to look for his brother. He found his rifle leaned up against a tree, but there was no sign of his sibling. Empty-handed and saddened, he took a shortcut deep into the woods. While he was walking, he came upon a small creek that trickled into a cool blue pool of water. He decided to stop for a drink. Forming a cup with his hands, he dipped them into the pool and brought the water to his lips. My child, what are you doing in my waters? The boy looked around but could not locate the source of the voice. My lord, I am sorry to have disturbed your waters. I did not know this was someone's property. Do not fret, my child. I only ask that you fill my cup. The second eldest said, If you show yourself, I would gladly fill it for you. A shadow then covered the pool, and the voice said, Well, my child, then look behind you. Days went by, and not one son returned home. The father knew that something was wrong, so he decided to ask the water in his wishing well. The water sat still for a second, then bubbled over. A large bubble appeared, and it projected something distorted, something grotesque and deformed lumbering through the woods. The bubble then burst. The father decided to cast a sight spell. Clear as night, fast and bright, let me see my sons tonight. There the well sat, no boiling, no bubbles, just water. The father leaned over and looked at the bottom and saw his sons. They were in a cave lying on a pile of bones at Hog Scald Hollow. It was common knowledge that old Scratch Eyes would strip the skin and bones from his victims and distill their souls into a potion that gave him powers even death was said to fear. The father's heart broke and his anger rose. He went to his cabinet and started to gather roots and bones and feathers and blood, for this was dark magic. 
the stuff he swore never to use. He chanted as he dropped each ingredient into the well, while the image of his sons rippled away as the items fell in. Raw head and bloody bones. Raw head and bloody bones bring old scratch eyes to my home, he chanted. The wind began to howl and a fog crept up around his house. The sun faded and a darkness surrounded his mountain. He continued to chant, Raw head and bloody bones, raw head and bloody bones, bring old scratch eyes to my home, until it sounded like he was speaking thunder. Just then a lightning bolt shot up out of the well and rocketed towards an unknown destination. Across the hills, old scratch eyes was scratching around his cave and was suddenly struck with a beam of white light before disappearing entirely. With a thud, he landed at the edge of the property of the yarb doctor. The man had gone his whole life avoiding this creature, and he had now brought him straight to his home. Old Scratch Eyes was crouched and slowly rose, asking, And what does the good doctor intend to do now that I know where he lives? The father pleaded with the beast, saying, Please don't take my sons. I will work as your humble servant in exchange. Just then, his daughter came running around the house, begging her father not to go. The girl, said Old Scratch Eyes. I will take her in their stead. No, said the father. Not only no, but hellfire and damnation no. Old Scratch Eyes didn't move, but was on top of them before they could even react. He leaned down to look at the father who dared not look up. No, good doctor. There is only my way, and you are only to surrender. Old Scratch Eyes took the girl in his right hand and snapped his fingers with his left A cloud of smoke covered old Scratch Eyes and the girl, and when the smoke cleared, the two sons were standing in their place. The father and sons embraced and went inside to plot revenge on the creature. The father knew of a flower that grew way up high on the ridges of the Washita Mountains that was said to render one invisible to their enemies. So he and his two sons set out to find that flower. They walked and hiked and climbed for seven days and seven nights until they reached the peak of Sister Mountain. There, the tip top was a small pond surrounded by the most beautiful golden flowers. The father plucked two large bulbs and off they went. They then traveled south to the Mucklebone Marshlands to find Old Scratch Eyes Cave. When the three of them approached the cave, the father made his potion. He removed the pistol of each flower and poured a single drop of nectar into a teardrop bottle and whispered something secret. He took one drop of the potion and touched it to the rock entrance at the cave. He then told the boys to wait on either side and that when their sister came out, they should take her and run. But what about you, the eldest asked. Don't worry, the father said. I will be just fine. The father took the other drop of his potion and placed it on his forehead and ventured deep into the cave. He followed a long hall with bones and ancient artifacts strewn about and found a crystal carved with runes that he thought might be useful. Soon enough, he saw the flickering of a candlelight further ahead. He crept around until he came to a room where he could hear old scratch eyes scratching in the dark. He spoke to his new crystal in the ancient language that he knew it would know. Yal de aformod fet un forma, son a half de un fiendes, and it came to life, lighting up with faint pulses of white light. He tossed the crystal into the room and heard an angry cry when it exploded into a ball of white light. While old Scratch Eyes was blinded and distracted, the father grabbed his daughter and ran for it. They got to the top of the cave when a greasy, slimy hand took hold of the father and pulled him back down into the darkness. But what old Scratch Eyes didn't know was that the father had cast a containment spell on the cave. The drops he had used tied him and the cave together, and now an invisible wall closed off the cave so that no one could enter and no one could leave. The daughter made it out and into the arms of her brothers, who then whisked her away. They never saw their father again, but they never saw old Scratch Eyes either. The three of them went on to make their own families, teaching them the magic that their father had once taught them. They all went on to live long and happy lives on a hill in hope.
Hello, my name is Dalton Dodson. I'm a history and folklore student. My tale is a collection of motifs and plot devices from a re reconstructed oral tale inspired by the work of Peregrine Honig. I present to you, Hungry Like the Wolf. Once, there was a girl in a hood who wandered into the woods to visit her grandmother's house, despite her mother's explicit wish not to do so alone. After arriving, she was offered what she thought would be meat and wine and quickly swallowed them. It was then she noticed the grandmother's peculiar eyes, ears, and finally, the teeth. By that moment, it was too late. The wolf posing as her grandmother attacked and would have killed her if it was not for a wandering woodsman who had heard the commotion from afar. He burged into the cottage as fast as he could, arriving just in time to cut down the wolf. The only thing that had occurred was a small but deep bite to the girl's arm. Years passed from this horrific event, and it soon faded from the local consciousness. The woodsman later married the girl, now woman, in a hood. They lived happily together for a time. One day, the woman in a hood rose to a strange feeling in her gut. She went to the kitchen to get something to eat, but nothing seemed to satisfy her hunger. The hunger continued growing until it was unbearable. Just then, she noticed a rabbit by her garden. She thought maybe she could eat the rabbit. She lunged at it, grabbing forcefully. Before she had intended to cook the rabbit, but something urged her to bite into the creature. Raw. By the time the morsel had touched the back of her throat, her hunger subsided. She came to her senses and realized what she had done and buried the rest of the creature in the garden. Time passed and her husband, the woodsman, arrived. She welcomed him home with a warm dinner. The woman informed her husband of her strange feeling that day. The woodsman stopped eating, stunned. So uh, you've been having abnormal cravings? She thought back to the rabbit and began to tear up. I was afraid of that. So you know what's wrong? The woodsman hesitated. Do you remember what happened all those years ago? How could I forget? Well, when I got there, the wolf had already bitten you. I didn't think anything of it at the time, but these cravings you describe are characteristics of lycanthropy. You mean I'm becoming like that thing? Why now, after all this time? It can lie dormant. Unfortunately, there's only one action to take. The woodsman grabbed his axe and swung at the woman. Afraid for her life, she ran into the wood. Her fear turned to pain as she felt her body shifting, and eventually, just as the woodsman described, she turned from human to wolf. She thrashed at the woodsman who had every intention of killing the creature who had once been his wife. In the end, the wolf got the upper hand and killed the woodsman. It changed back into the woman and took the woodsman's ax to make sure he was dead. She understood the feelings now and came to embrace them. Soon she found herself wandering the woods and came across a young girl who was out picking berries. The girl greeted the woman and asked if there was something she needed. I'm just hungry. Well, I have plenty of berries here if you would like. That'll do for now. Do you live nearby? I live across the forest, but I'm visiting my grandmother who lives just beyond that hill. Thank you for the information. And just like that, she was off to the grandmother's house. When the girl arrived, she was offered what she thought to be meat and wine and quickly swallowed them. When she went into the grandmother's room, she spoke aloud. Grandmother, what big eyes you have. The better to see you with, my dear. Grandmother, what big ears you have. The better to hear you with, my dear. Grandmother, what big teeth you have! The better to eat you with, my dear. With those final words, the wolf attacked and sank its teeth into the flesh of the girl, and like before, a woodsman arrived before major damage could be done. With one fatal strike, the woman in a hood, like the wolf before her, took her final breath. Years passed, and soon the girl grew into a woman and married the woodsman who had intervened. 
Like the woman before her, the change eventually took hold, and she gave it to the nature of the wolf. The cycle continued, ever flowing towards the same conclusion. Until one day, the wolf arrived at the grandmother's house and hurried on with the usual routine. When the girl arrived, she did not partake in the meat and wine that was offered. When it came time to join the wolf, posing as the grandmother in the bed, she tricked the wolf by claiming she had to relieve herself outside. After much arguing back and forth, the wolf finally relented by tying a piece of rope to her leg and let her go outside through the window. The girl was crafty and untied the rope, substituting her leg for a pipe. The wolf called out to her, Little one, are you done? No answer came. Little one? The wolf yelled louder. Again, no answer. Finally, the wolf got out of bed and approached the window. The wolf saw the rope was now tied around the pipe, and the girl had escaped. Little one! The wolf howled. The wolf took after the girl and soon caught up. In the nick of time, she managed to get inside her home and bar the door. Her mother was confused until she saw what her daughter had been running from. The girl went to her father's room, grabbed his rifle, and hurried back just as the wolf broke through. With one clean shot, she fell the beast before any damage could be done to her or her mother. And with that action, the cycle had broken. Thanks to her cunning, no more would the girl eventually become the monster she faced. So ends Hungry Like the Wolf. Hello, my name is Scott Hermans, and I am a violin performance and German Scandinavian studies double major. It has been a wonderful experience working through the German fairy tales class with Professor Osmeyer, and I am honored to be able to share my fairy tale with you. It is titled The Ace of Diamonds, and it is a modern take on the fairy tale style of the Brothers Grimm. It is, ex it is inspired by the print by Peregrine Honig titled Snow. And in the fairy tale, I grapple with ideas and implications of cheating in an academic environment. I encourage you as the listener to think about this as you listen to it. In the fairy tale, you will hear a song sung by a character known as the Businessman or the Ace of Diamonds. And this song was taken from the Broadway musical Mary Poppins. And in this musical, it is sung by the character Von Hustler. Thank you and enjoy. There once was a beautiful girl with chestnut colored hair who lived in an impoverished town where there was nothing to do but work in a coal mine. At the end of each day, she would come home from the brutal work to her parents, who waited with heavy hearts. They knew that this was no life for their daughter, but they had no means to change anything, for the coal mine was the only way anyone could make any money in the town. Every night the girl would dream of going back in time to a past where people could be free to do what they want. She told these dreams to the other people in the coal mine, but they did not understand what she meant. Word traveled far, and it was not long before a well-dressed man showed up on her doorstep. I come from a faraway land, land, where there is a very powerful businessman. He knows all about your wish to travel back in time, and if you supply him with one ounce of gold every year for three years in a row, he will ensure that your wish comes true. She accepted the offer and rode with the messenger to the faraway land. The girl wanted to free not just herself, but her entire family. She vowed to take them with her upon her return. When the two travelers arrived to the town of the businessman, she could not believe how many other beautiful girls there were. The businessman lived in a mansion that towered over all the other buildings and houses in the area. As she walked through the front doors, she was met with cobwebs that drifted down from the ceiling. She pushed through the cobwebs and found herself alone in the room with the businessman. He was quite tall and wore a coat embroidered with a magnificent ace of diamonds. He leapt from his chair and sang, 
A man has dreams of building an empire to make his name in many a distant land. And in the new world, I am told, we'll soon strike gold. We'll seize this chance with both our hands. Just then, a door swung open and a gigantic grasshopper emerged from the shadows. He too was well dressed and spoke with poise and eloquence, although he had a long chain that trailed back behind him and attached him to the room from which he came. It was quickly agreed upon that the grasshopper would show her how to build a clock for traveling back in time. It would take three years of hard work, but in the end, she could bring this clock back to her family and they could all travel together to the land of freedom. The clock would need three things, a grapevine for its face, an hourglass for its body, and her hair, the girl's hair, to bind the machine together. They would meet three times, once each year, and the first, at first, the girl would present the grapevine, at the second meeting, she would present the hourglass, and then at the third, her hair. Along with the hair and the hourglass and the grapevine, she would present one ounce of gold each time for the businessman. The grapevine was easy to grow, but she had to travel back to her home where she worked back-breaking hours in the coal mine for the gold. On her first meeting with the grasshopper in his studio, she could hear the businessman outside. A man has dreams of building an empire to make his name in many distant land and in a new world, I am told, We'll soon strike gold. We'll seize this chance with both our hands. The grasshopper congratulated her for her diligent work and sent her on her way. The hourglass was easy to blow, as she had been given the tools to perfect the glass blowing art. But upon her returning home, she was not allowed into the mine to work. The townspeople had begun to hate the girl, for they felt that she had left them behind, and they punished her by preventing her from working. When she returned to the town where she was building the clock, she asked one of the business, or the beautiful brown haired girls she saw on the street, how she earned her money in this town. You must travel to the end of the district and talk to the ace of diamonds, responded the girl on the street. Encouraged by these words, the girl with chestnut hair walked to the edge of town and ran face to face with none other than the businessman. Without saying a word, he led her to a modern, fancy building and introduced her to an older, elegantly dressed man, with whom she agreed to spend the night in exchange for small payment. Half the money she earned in this work was pocketed by the businessman. She hated this work even more than the factory, although she did, or the coal mine, although she did it nonetheless, for it promised for a better future. On her second meeting with the grasshopper in his studio, the girl could hear the businessman singing to himself out time, outside. A man has dreams of building an empire to make his name in many distant land. And in the new world, I am told, we'll soon strike gold. We'll seize this chance with both our hands. The grasshopper congratulated her for her diligent work, but when asked to present the ounce of gold, she was short one seventh of an ounce. At this moment, the businessman burst through the door. You will bring not one ounce of gold next time, but two, he shouted. The, determined, the girl worked twice as hard this week. Before her third meeting with the grasshopper, she hesitated. On her way to the business monger, she said to herself, why should I have to cut off my beautiful hair? One of the city's beautiful brown haired girls heard her whisper, in dying of depression and exhaustion, she said, Take my hair, travel on light air, break the Ace of Diamonds affair. When she met the grasshopper in his studio, the girl could hear the businessman singing to himself outside. A man has dreams of building an empire to make his name in many distant land. And in the new world, I am told, will soon strike gold. We'll seize this chance with both our hands. She presented the grasshopper with the bag of hair, but he shook his head, for not a centimeter of that hair was hers. It is not fair 
of you to ask me to cut off my beautiful hair. I have brought you the chestnut hair of another girl. It will work, as it is the same color and has the same feel as my own. And if you do not accept this hair, then I refuse to pay any more money. At this moment, the businessman burst through the door. This time, his anger was not directed at the girl, but rather the grasshopper. You will let her use the hair that she has brought you, he shouted. And so they constructed the time machine. But the grasshopper warned that it would not work properly with the hair of another girl. Once it was finished and glimmering in the sun, it emitted a bell-like sound three times. As the girl was leaving with her clock, she took the long chain that kept the grasshopper tied to her studio and strangled the businessman. Before she walked out the door, she lifted the Ace of Diamonds jacket from his frame and draped it over her own shoulders, for it was cold outside. The clock took her and her family back in time to a better time, but it was only a scant improvement over their previous circumstances. And the girl knew that it was only a matter of time before things became bad again. The end. Once upon a time, we all know and love this phrase, which conjures images of fantastical fairy tales and their utopian happy ends. However, the genre is much more complex as our lives are charged with questions of injustice, inequality, and social upheaval. Utopian and dystopian tales are commenting on each other and on the world we live in. We wish all of us the imaginary power to envision beauty and harmony. But to do this, we first must look the depressive disenchantment in the eyes. Thank you for allowing us to share some of our work and we hope that you too feel inspired by the marvelous. Hello, my name is Hannah Sebring and I'm an environmental studies senior. My story is adapted from Laos folklore and is adapted to being more modern because of the inclusion of more details and the integration of two stories into one. My story is entitled The Magic White Swan. In a river deep in the heart of Laos, there was a fisherman. He came to the same spot on the river every day with the same net, clothes, and story to tell. He would stand on the bank of the river and tell passing birds the story of the river's history. One day, a foreigner had come to visit the nearby village. They went exploring out on their own and cut down a tree without asking permission. Upon this misdeed, the tree turned into a snake and slithered from the nearby village all the way across Laos. The snake found refuge in the river, and some say you can still see the marks leading into its cave today. Unfortunate souls who pass by the snake's den never return, for the spirit lures them into the river where they perish in its depths. The fisherman would come at dawn to cast his net in the wide river and repeat this story. He used the same net he had since his father had taught him the practice as a young boy. Each day he wore the same red cloth to protect himself from the sun. And each day he would tell the same story to the birds, hoping the lull of his voice would attract fish. Each day he went home exhausted from the sun, empty net in hand. His father had told him the story of the river when the fisherman was a young boy. They would come into this routine each day at the water's edge. But the man's father had passed long ago in an accident on the river's bank. But the fisherman kept returning each day to honor his father's memory and put food on his plate. One day, while he was telling a beautiful swan of the snake's journey across the country, the fisherman felt his net catch. Suddenly, it was heavy to pull in, and his heart began to race with excitement. Fish! But when the worn net reached the shore, there was nothing in it but a white pebble. It was the most beautiful pebble the fisherman had ever seen. Although slightly disappointed the pebble could not feed him for the evening, he happily took it home. He placed it on the altar above his head overnight for good luck. In the morning, the fisherman awoke and the pebble was gone. In its place was a beautiful white swan. The fisherman was in shock, but the swan approached him and said, I will take you to a beautiful place where there are the most plumerias you have ever seen. The fisherman reluctantly boarded the swan and soon they arrived at a beautiful grove. The fisherman knew he wanted to remember the beauty of the grove, so he began to pick plumerias. But he noticed as he picked the flowers, they grew heavier and heavier. He picked one which was slightly heavy, and then another which was weighing his hand down. 
And when he went to pick the third one, he could barely hold all the flowers in his two hands. When he had picked all three beautiful white plumerias, the fishermen worried the swan could not bear the weight of him and any more flowers. So home to the village they went. The swan left in the evening, and while the fishermen slept, the plumerias turned to solid gold. Shocked and suddenly very wealthy, the fisherman ran to tell his friends. The next day, one of them arrived at the fisherman's house. I am down on my luck, the friend told the fisherman. Will you please take me to the golden grove? Eager to help his friend, the fisherman took the man down to the river bank where he had gone every day. They fished all through the night and into the dawn. The friend grew very tired as the day waned on. But finally, as the sun began to dip below the horizon, the friend felt the weight of the pebble. As the night before, the white swan appeared and offered to take the man to the golden plumeria grove. Knowing the powers of the grove, the man began frantically picking the flowers. He had picked so many that when he finally boarded the swan to take him back home, the bird could barely fly. Once home, he did exactly as the fisherman instructed and placed the cold plumerias on his altar, anxiously awaiting morning. And when dawn came, there were no golden plumerias, but normal white ones. The man had been too greedy and the swan saw him unworthy of the golden flowers. Thank you.